Good morning, Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to United Israel World Union. This is our Sabbath morning scripture study coming to you live from St. Francisville, Louisiana. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, we are in class 19 of our current series, um, which puts us number six in the book of Exodus, or Shemot, as it's called in Hebrew. We are still, if you talk about where we are in the story, we are still at Horev. We're going to be at Horev, according to the uh, progression of things in the Pentateuch, until Numbers chapter 10. In Numbers chapter 10, the cloud lifts and moves, and the children of Israel obediently follow that cloud. But until that point, we are going to remain at Horev. Notice I use Horeb like the writer of Deuteronomy. Sinai is another name you might be familiar with, perhaps more familiar with than the book uh, of Deuteronomy's reference to Horeb. Now, I want to do something a little bit differently today uh, than I've done in the past, and I even prepared a handout. Now, if someone wouldn't mind, I know some are on Facebook, some are not on Facebook, some of you on YouTube who don't use Facebook. I posted a document. I think it's five pages that we're going to use, a handout, if you will, uh, to work through some material. And I've called the, the handout, After the Day of Assembly at Horev, a horizontal study. So if someone one of my friends out there could post the link both to where I placed it on Facebook and on our website, the direct link to get the PDF. I would greatly appreciate that. We're going to need that. It's going to make it easier for you to follow along uh, as I teach today's class. Uh, so I want to provide you today with a tool, not necessarily the sheet, the sheet, the worksheet that I've, that I've got today or that I've produced for today's class, is simply to show you how to use a tool. It doesn't have to be a sheet. It's a method. It's a process uh, that I believe is very helpful for us in biblical studies. Uh, I call it horizontal study. Now, I wish I could give credit to the right person. I believe, I believe that I first read the term or the phrase horizontal study in a Bart Ehrman book, but I just can't remember, so I'm not trying to take credit for it. But the idea is you will see, some of you have heard me mention this in, in uh, previous classes, is that rather than study a text vertically, meaning I would read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you look for similar narrative sections in books, for instance, if there is a narrative section in the book of Exodus that is telling the same story as a narrative section in Deuteronomy, you would put those side by side. And that's what I mean by horizontal. And I also want to say that I'm sure that almost intuitively, some of you use this method, this process, even if you don't know you're using it, you know. When you look for references, if you're doing a word study or a study of a phrase or you're studying a, a certain uh, narrative section, you want to find out where else does the Bible talk about this, you'll search that out yourself. This is just a razor focus way of doing that. Um, it's a method that I use all the time. Anyone who comes up to the building and sees me working during the week, I know John and I see each other quite a bit, uh, but others have seen me. I'll do this on paper. I'll do it on my dry erase board at times where I put a text here, and then I'll draw a line, and I'll put another text. In fact, I, I've even told you, I've asked you on occasion, I want you to get a piece of paper and draw three lines. And in this one, put Exodus such and such. In this one, that way you can compare. So I know that people do this, but this is just really, uh, I think, important. Now, rarely do I type out and prepare a sheet 
uh, for our Saturday morning class. But that's how important this is. I, I was hopeful that it can be used to, to illustrate for you, to demonstrate for you per, uh, perhaps a tool that's going to be beneficial for you. And it, it will give you some insight into the way I study uh, if, if you're interested. Now, this process, what I'm calling horizontal study, allows or enables us to compare and contrast, right? Uh, texts that employ the same words, the same phrases, uh, similar concepts, and even narrative sections, one with the other. And often, I have found that only by doing this, only by compare and contrast, do we get uh, to truly understand the biblical narrative. I think that at times, <clears throat> if we don't do this in one way or another, we miss details. We miss important details, and I think that this is absolutely essential. Now, uh, scholars and sages... Christian scholars, Jewish scholars, and uh, you, you might say uh, um, uh, academic scholars use this methodology to uh, examine text to discover and discern certain things that, that you otherwise would miss. And they've been doing this, these scholars and sages have been doing this since as long as the Bible has been studied. Now, they may not call it horizontal study, but they've been doing this where they compare and contrast uh, for a very long time. Now, what is surprising to me, what is surprising to me is that it's rarely used when people study narratives within the Pentateuch. It's rarely used, and I find that really surprising because you are robbing yourself of some great insight by not doing this. Now, New Testament scholars, on the other hand, uh, scholars who study the Christian writings, have mastered this, have perfected this. I just want to show you, uh, and I have a shelf full of these. I just brought a couple of examples. Uh, this one is Throckmorton. And it is the Gospel Parallels, a synopsis of the first three Gospels. And it compares Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know that the Greek term synopsis, the, type, the word synopsis is tied to the Greek word, which means same. And the idea, bear with me, this is not a Gospel class, but it is good news, so stick with me. You're going to learn something today, I promise you. Uh, but the synoptics because they tell the similar story, at times, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the same story. Now, if you list those side by side, sometimes it's Matthew and Luke, sometimes it's this, that. When you put them side by side, you notice differences. By the way, here's another one. Uh, a synopsis of the four Gospels. Uh, this also is very helpful. <clears throat> so, Gospel students... New Testament students and scholars have really got this down. They compare these on what are called harmonies with beneficial results. Much, much has been learned in the academic world particularly by doing this. In other words, they discovered by doing this sort of thing that at times uh, some of these texts are verbatim. Now, how did they come up with verbatim? Well, scholars began to look and they said, you know, every time this gospel writer says this and this gospel writer says this, it seems to be drawing from a source which we no longer have. And you know the gospel of Q as it's called. So anyway, great insights into gospel studies. And guess what? Pentateuchal studies, the Hebrew Bible studies, eh, We'll do it a different way. It's like they're working in different rooms. I, I, I started wondering, because my background was from Christianity, I started wondering, why don't they have one of these handy little books for the Torah stories? 
And I began to look, uh, and they weren't there. But let me add one more detail. Now, I know some of you uh, are Tanakh only. Most of you are Tanakh only. So you might be thinking, I don't even want to hear anything about gospel studies. Well, you're missing something very important if you think like that. A lot of people in our community have come to say that the gospel text and the Christianity and the New Testament, uh, none of that has any value whatsoever, and so you've left that behind. And, And there are friends of mine who actually do many, many YouTube videos to laugh and jeer, you know, acquaintances of mine, at, oh, look, Matthew said this and Mark said that, and they can't even get their story straight. But that doesn't happen in the Pentateuch, they would say. Well, take a pause. Let's be careful, and let's think about this, and let's study for real. Let's no longer have certain preconditioned ideas when we uh, approach a text. Let's read the text, and let's study, and let's use every tool everything that people have developed over time to get at a better understanding of these texts. Now, again, New Testament scholars have mastered it. It's very limited what you can find for the study of the Hebrew Bible that does this sort of thing. So I began to search a couple of years ago, and of course I typed in, I knew what I was looking for. I was looking for a harmony of the biblical narratives from the Pentateuch. Well, you you try different combinations in Dr. Google. And so I said, uh, give me a harmony of the Torah. That doesn't do it. Uh, Give me side-by-side comparison of stories from the Torah. That doesn't do it. Nothing, nothing. Search, search. Try different uh, search methods and different words and phrases. And I looked and looked and couldn't find one. Still to this day have not found one. Now, put this aside. Don't stop listening to me to go find me that book. Do that, but do it later. Help me find that. In the meantime, I've begun to work on my own Torah commentary where I do this sort of thing. Now, you know, I have certain ideas. I've worked on it, and uh, I've got some things in my mind, but I really want to produce one of these Uh, but also don't want to produce something if it already existed. So if you find it, let me know. Look for it later. What I did find in those crazy searches were two books, and I mentioned them before. These are the two books. Uh, Some of you have ordered these when I'm in for it. It is edited by James Newsom, Jr. It's a synoptic harmony. That's what I'm looking for of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles with related passages from Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezra. This is a Bible lover's dream. It takes, like when you look at, if you read 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, you know, or 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd, you read through those historical books, you'll notice that some of the stories are told in Kings and Chronicles, for instance. You, you never, if you read it vertically, you never notice that there are differences. But honey, if you put them side by side, you find some interesting variations between the stories. Now, I want something like this for the Pentateuch. And since there isn't one that I know of, that's what we're going to talk about today. But when you, let me just say this again, when you do this exercise and you compare a certain story in Kings versus Chronicles and you put them side by side, be warned, there are variations. Some are what you might consider to be significant. Be warned, that's what you're going to find. But listen, relax. Don't be worried. This is a beautiful thing. It's not something that I want to use to pick apart 
or to jeer at, like some people that I know do with Christian texts, that's not my field. It's not my faith. However, I'm still not going to do that. But when I look at the Hebrew Bible and I make a similar exercise, and I do a similar exercise, I notice that there are what some would call discrepancies, don't freak out, between one account here and another account there. Uh, it allows us, by doing this, uh, to look at the same event that's presented side by side for comparison and contrast in these different sources. Now, let me give you one example, just a brief example from uh, Samuel and Kings. If you compare Samuel and Kings, I mean, uh, Kings and Chronicles side by side, and let's take a big event. How about the reform of Josiah? Everybody knows the story. Josiah, eight-year-old boy, he becomes king, right? He's got a heart after God. We learn that in the 18th year of his reign, how old is he? He's 26 years old. Jeremiah grows up at the same time. He's also young. They're probably, you know, mid-20s, both of them. People like to picture Jeremiah as a Gandalf-looking guy, long beard and, you know, that kind of thing uh, when the events happen. But he's a young man. So you have this uh, priestly figure and a Davidic figure, and they're in their mid-twenties when this revival takes place, this reform. Now, if you look at the details of these stories, let me just say, uh, the story of Josiah's reform is told in Kings and Chronicles. In 2 Kings, begins in 23, the, the revival where Josiah brings about a great reform in the land, destroys idols and stuff like that. That happens after the discovery of the scroll of the Torah that Moses wrote in the temple. You remember the story where Shaphan and, and uh, uh, Hilkiah, they're, they're working. Hilkiah discovers a scroll. According to 2 Kings, after the scroll is discovered, the great revival takes place. Um, now, if you read the story, 2 Chronicles 34, about the, um, if you look at them side by side, 2 Kings 23, 2 Chronicles 34, and following, put them side by side, read the whole story. One of the differences is, according to 2 Kings, a revival takes place after the discovery of the scroll. It makes sense, Right? You know, they discover a scroll, they rip their garments, they realize that they haven't been living according to the Torah that Moses wrote, and a great revival takes place. Second Chronicles says, eh, well, let me tell you, there was a great revival. There was a scroll discovered. Hilkiah is involved. Josiah is the king, etc., etc. However, Josiah was righteous before the scroll was discovered, and therefore, the, the revival, the reform happened well before the discovery of the scroll. Now, that's a big difference. It's not insurmountable. It doesn't cause me to doubt the biblical veracity of the story. What it does is tell me that we have two different sources. We have two different stories. One says... There's a revival. The other says there's a revival. One said it started happening before the scroll was discovered. Another said, no, no, nothing happened until after the scroll was discovered. I encourage you to read that on your own. Now, these, here's my point. <clears throat> these variations exist, and they exist in the Tanakh. Mark it down. You're going to see them. Now, an apologist... I don't necessarily like that word because an apologist, a fundamentalist, tries to conflate things and is damned and determined, I don't know if I should say that, to prove that all of these things work together and that it all makes perfect sense and they ignore the differences. I don't do that. 
Because by doing that, by ignoring difficult text, by throwing out one side, you have silenced a voice from antiquity. You have shut down the pen of one of our ancient sources. And you may have shut down the wrong pen. A historian, a believer, a seeker must wrestle with these things, must look at differences and variations and seek to come up with what's the most sense here? How do we get past this? Is it something that we can resolve? Do we have other supporting texts? Do we have other ways to say, the writer here is mistaken because I have five sources that validate the other or whatever. These variants exist. Rather than ignore them, we should seek to understand them. What do they teach us? What do they teach us about the authors and about the sources? about the time in which they wrote, about the place where they wrote from, and about the motivation they might have to put forward their version of history. The Pentateuch, the five books attributed to Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, also contain multiple accounts of several stories. When we compare those various accounts, we will find, mark it down, differences. Just like you find in other ancient documents. Don't be scared. Don't give up. Relax. It's okay. It's what we have come to expect from our sources. This is the nature of the sources that we're dealing with. A lot of people don't like the term Old Testament. It is very old. We're drawing on a document for the elements of our faith from a document which was written over a long period of time by multiple authors. And when you look at the Christian Gospels, for instance, we don't have autographed copies. We don't know if a Matthew actually wrote the book called Matthew. We don't know if a man named Mark wrote the Gospel according to Mark, etc., etc. But we do have what appear to be four separate sources for sometimes similar stories, similar narratives. With the five books, with the Pentateuch, we don't have separated like that the sources. The redaction process, the editing that took place, has pulled these sources together into one flowing narrative. And the task before scholarship, particularly over the last couple of hundred years, has been to really see if we can identify the sources. Like it is traditionally put forward that Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we've talked about that. I've taught classes on that. Uh, I know that's a traditional belief. I know that is something people have hung on to and clung on to, and I hate to take that from you, but I am. I do believe that Moses wrote a scroll, and I do believe that we can get back at some of what Moses actually wrote, but I also believe that within these texts we find evidence of other sources. Now, uh, the Pentateuch does contain these different narratives. Last week, I mentioned an example. The burden of leadership. You recall in the burden of leadership, we have a couple of different sources. 
If you look at Exodus chapter 18, Jethro is involved in the development of a leadership process whereby there is going to be an appointment of leaders over the thousands, the hundreds, etc. Uh, we also have another version of that story told in Deuteronomy uh, where Jethro is not mentioned and Moses says that he set this up. Now, what people typically will do is they'll take those two accounts they don't read them horizontally, they read it vertically. So by the time you get through Exodus 18 and you read all the way through the end of Exodus, Leviticus, you get to Numbers, you read it. By the time you get to Deuteronomy 1, you no longer have fresh on your mind what you know about the burden of leadership from Exodus 18. And you just conflate the two. And so you go, well, yeah, you know, Moses was trying to do this by himself and there was a system set up where uh, the uh, leadership burden was shared amongst the people. Well, that's the gist of it. That is historically accurate, I would say. But what we miss when we don't look at it horizontally is we miss this. In Exodus 18, Jethro is clearly the one who comes up with the system. In, in Deuteronomy 1, no mention of Jethro. In Exodus 18, this takes place before the revelation at Sinai. In Deuteronomy 1, it says it took place after Sinai. Now, you look at them side by side and you have to say, we have some variation here. Now, I'm not here to decide what that means today. What I'm here to do is just to say, we have these differences, we have to face them, we have to study them, and we have to seek to understand why there are differences. Now, we're talking about Horeb. Today I want to look at the events following what is called the Day of the Assembly. Now last night, uh, I never get to join in live in the fun, but I know Cheryl McWilliams uh, does classes, and so uh, just a shout out to my friend Cheryl. I know that she did one last night, and late, late last night, I got to watch just a piece of it, and she was talking about the, the word kahal, the, uh, the term assembly. This has really been on her mind and, and heart over the last week, and she, was, she, she really did an in-depth study on it, uh, which I hope to watch later. But here's the idea. I'm also thinking about this term because we're at Horev, and according to the writer of Deuteronomy, at least parts of Deuteronomy, the phrase, the day of the assembly, is used to describe the day that God spoke audibly to an assembled group, and it's called the day of the assembly. It's only used in Deuteronomy. It's not used in Exodus. Now, some people might say, wait a minute, the word assembly is used here, here, here. Listen to me. I know people do that when I teach sometimes. They'll find something and think, well, that's wrong. Look for the phrase, day of the assembly. Not assembly, not day. Day of the assembly. It, particularly defining the day that God gave the, the uh, uh, testimony to the children of Israel from Horeb. It's only used in Deuteronomy. It's only used three times, and it's only used in first-person narrative. I'm going to read those to you this morning. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 9. And the reason I want to do this is to set the stage because, remember, my handout is after the day of assembly at Horev, a horizontal study. So I want to give you the reference point for the day of the assembly. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 10. Deuteronomy 9, 10. I apologize for just uh, taking parts of this context. And Jehovah gave me the two tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God with the exact words that Jehovah had addressed to you 
on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of the assembly. Reference number one. Reference number two is chapter 10, verse 4. Jehovah inscribed on the tablets the same text as on the first, the ten words that he addressed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of assembly, and Jehovah gave them to me. By the way, anybody get an idea of what might be written on those two tablets of stone? People have different ideas of what all was written on the stone. Some, uh, some say uh, all the commandments, you know, the ten words plus all the additional commandments. We encounter some of those today in Mishpatim. Uh, some say all of that, all of this, and the oral laws, okay? So what was on the tablets? Well, according to Deuteronomy 9, 10, and 10, 4, the ten words. That's it. Look at uh, chapter 18, Deuteronomy 18, verse 16. These are the only three references to the phrase, day of the assembly, 1816. This is just what you ask of Jehovah your God at Horeb on the day of assembly, saying, let me not hear the voice of Jehovah my God any longer or see this wondrous fire anymore, lest I die the day of the assembly. Now, as a way of demonstrating to you, for you, with you today, my method of studying the text to look for details, to ensure that I'm not missing a thing. I look for key words, phrases, and I put them side by side when I have similar narratives. As a way of demonstrating this, I want to look at what our sources say took place after the day of the assembly. Now, hopefully some of my dear friends have posted the link to this paper. You'll notice at the top I have the title, After the Day of the Assembly at Horeb, a Horizontal Study. And uh, let me see if I have mine, all the pages here. <clears throat> We're going to work through this. We're not going to spend you know, uh, a great amount of time, and, and there can be other things, like my copy, I have what you have, but also have notes. Like I'll also add, oh, and don't forget this text, and what about in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel? I'm just going to focus right here, right now, just to make the point. Now, a couple of things to bring up is that this exercise that we're going to do is mainly to focus on, just to illustrate the, the method, we're going to focus on the response of the people to what took place on the day of assembly. Right? We know they were afraid, etc. We're going to look at what do the different sources say. Um, the fear of the people. What did they say to Moses? And then we're going to look at are there different narrative sections? Shake your head, 12 to 6. Yes, there are. Um, the, we're going to look at the details. We're going to look at the order of the events uh, between our sources, the timing, such as when did God give the, the stone tablets? All right, you have the day of the assembly and the words are spoken. Uh, are the tablets cut at that time? Are they engraved at that time, or does it happen later? Well, we're going to have to look at that. We're going to see, do our sources agree? We have to find out. I mean, inquiring minds want to know. Now, this is a partial look just to provide an example of this method. The material that we're going to use, you can see it on the sheet, comes from Exodus and Deuteronomy. In this case, and quite often, it's going to be comparing a narrative section in the book of Exodus with a narrative section in, say, the book of Deuteronomy. When you study, you'll do this quite often. Uh, the relevant sections, narrative sections, that tell what I want to look at today are in, in Exodus are chapters 20, 24, 31, and 32. You see that along the top? And I'm going to compare that what I find in Exodus 20, 24, 31, 32, with what I find in Deuteronomy 5, middle column, and then what I find in Deuteronomy 9 and 18 in the right-hand column. Those are our text 
I know that there are other things I could bring in, but I just, uh, I don't want to say I got lazy on the chart. This took me a little while to make. Could have made it better, bigger, but it's plenty for today. The relevant sections uh, are on the sheet, though. Now, get this. Differences do not mean, I'm not proposing to you that differences mean one is right, the other is wrong. Okay? Don't, don't think that. This is not to pick apart. This is to say, why does the writer in Exodus 20 say this, and the writer in Deuteronomy 5, whether it's the same person or not, why do they say something different? And if they do say something different, just saying if, does it mean that it's not the same writer? Not necessarily. It could be written, Deuteronomy 5 could be like people think, written much later. Maybe there's a lapse in uh, memory of detail or something. Who knows? But it doesn't mean one's right or one's wrong. This, this is to compare and contrast. Here's the deal. We are dealing with a special genre of literature. Now, I call this genre sacred history. Don't, not to be confused with history. History, someone might say history is absolutely, this is the way it went. This is, but if you pick any subject in history and you study it, you're going to find differences depending on the sources you look at, the perspective of the writer, the time in which it was written. New discoveries might shed light on a historical event, you know, outside of the Bible even. It just depends. Sacred history. I propose that people have approached these texts, our biblical text, with definitions and expectations that demand things of the text that may or may not have been seen as necessarily important to the ancient storyteller. Or as you might say, here's what I expect from my history. If you're going to tell me history, Moses, I want you to do it this way. <laughs> the other thing that happens is people come into the text and they say, there are absolutely no differences, there are absolutely no discrepancies. That's for people who study the Synoptic Gospels, not for us over here in this camp. Well, that's just silly. Let's look at these texts. Overall, here's a quick summary. This event, the day of the assembly, takes place, it's an unknown date. Now, I know tradition says Savan 6, uh, but it's an unknown date. We just call it the day of the assembly. We can come from the text, we can pretty much put it in the third month from the time they leave Egypt. We can do that, and so it's probably, probably, in the third month. It's probably early in the month, and so it's not a stretch to say that it could have been on the 6th of Sivan, but we don't know that, right? We just know that it's called the day of the assembly, and we only know that because of Deuteronomy. If you read Exodus, you're not going to find the phrase day of the assembly. We know, according to our sources, that on this day of assembly, God spoke to an assembled group conveying to them His ten words. We know from our sources that they are afraid and that they request that Moses, from that point forward, go to God, get any messages that he might have for them, and he, Moses, should bring them back and not that God should speak to them again. Because they fear that if God speaks to them again, they will die. That's what we know. We also know that the people from our sources agree to listen. You do this, Moses. You go get the message. You bring it back. You speak what God speaks to you. You speak to us, and we will listen or hear. Shema. We're going to listen. Now, at some later point, according to our sources, Moses goes back up the mountain alone. 
Moses stays 40 days and 40 nights. Moses receives two tablets of stone upon which are written, according to our sources, the ten words by the finger of God. Both books, Exodus and Deuteronomy, have this story. So we can all relax that those points, which are the important ones, are consistently told in Shemot and Devarim. All right? But by comparing side by side the details, we're able to observe language, words, phrases used by one and not the other. For instance, uh, I, I pointed out the day of the assembly used by the writer of the text I mentioned in Deuteronomy, but not by the writer in Exodus. And if you want to think that that's the same writer, that's okay. But just know that when the writer wrote Exodus, the writer did not write Day of Assembly. But when that writer, if it's the same, wrote Deuteronomy's narrative, it was very clear that the day was called the Day of the Assembly. That's the main point. Okay, now let's take a look at this document. We're not gonna, it's not going to take long to go through it. In fact, this might be a relatively short uh, work through. But um, a cu couple of comments on the features. If you look at page one, pages are numbered in the lower right-hand corner. So if you dropped them, your cat threw them off the table, whatever, and you picked them up, don't be confused. They're, the numbers are on the page. Page one, about midway through, You'll notice in my left column, which is Exodus 20, this is just to show you how to read it, it says the people were afraid and trembled and stood far off. Now that is, you'll notice were afraid is underlined and bold. Look at the next column. Deuteronomy 5 tells me the same phrase. For you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up into the mountain. Now notice the difference in the way it's presented. In Exodus 20, in verse 18, it's, it's referring the people were afraid. In Deuteronomy 5, Moses, according to our text, is addressing the people. And he says, for you were afraid. See the difference? Now, to me, that's significant. I think it's very important. It's why I spent so much time talking about it over the last couple of years. Uh, if you look down the next, next line on the left that has words in it, 2019, it says, and said to Moses. You see, that's just a continuation of what I said above. The people were afraid, trembled, and they stood far off. And said to Moses. What I'm doing is I'm breaking these verses apart to line up the text. And what you'll see is that to the right of that, you have Deuteronomy 5, Deuteronomy 5 adds details between they were afraid and said to Moses. Deuteronomy 5 says, And as soon as you heard the voice of the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said. You see that? So you see how it works. I'm just, I'm producing a sample um, harmony of... Pentateuch accounts. Okay. Bold and underline indicates uh, agreement, word agreement. Now, look at the very top, middle column, Deuteronomy 5.22. Now, I believe that's verse 19 uh, in English or Hebrew. There's going to be a difference there. These words, the Lord, Jehovah, spoke to all your assembly at the mountain, out of the midst of fire, the cloud, the thick darkness, with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he added no more. What does that tell you? According to the writer of Deuteronomy 5, he spoke these 10 words, and then, get this, he added no more. That's what he spoke to the people that were assembled. Did he also say, and oh, by the way, here are some other laws? No. Not at Horeb. Now, 
The interesting thing is that if you look at, now I've, I've got this later in my document, but I want to open my Bible to Deuteronomy 5.22 or verse 19 as the case might be. Uh, here it is. And the, the Lord spoke these words, those and no more to your whole congregation at the mountain with a mighty voice out of the fire and the dense clouds. And then it says, He inscribed them on two tablets of stone which He gave to me. Now, if you read Deuteronomy 5, particularly that verse, here's the way you understand the thing went down. God speaks from the mountain, from the cloud, from the fire, from the midst of the fire. And then Moses, he hands Moses the tablets with the words written on him right then. Is that the way that reads? Yeah, it's the way you would take it. And then after that, you notice uh, that there is uh, people are afraid, etc., etc. But according to, if we look at this side by side, we understand that Moses is giving us sort of a overall first. God spoke these words uh, to you out of the midst of fire, cloud, thick darkness, loud voice. He added no more. He wrote them on tablets, gave them to me. But that didn't happen right then. If you say, yes, it did, well, if it did, then Exodus has it wrong. I'm not suggesting either are wrong. I'm showing you that I have pulled. See, notice in my note it says 22B, see below, because I'm going to put that in its place to align it with Exodus's account. See, I'm not doing this uh, to, to bring... Uh, I guess, uh, discrepancies to the fore, I'm doing this to understand what happened in what order. Okay. Now, notice center column, next block of text says, the Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain out of the midst of the fire while I stood between Jehovah and you at that time to declare to you the word of Jehovah. Now, the reason I put that in here, notice I go all the way back to 5.4 because I now know Moses in 5.22 is giving an overview. Here's what happened. He spoke from the cloud and uh, from the midst of the fire. He wrote it on... That's an overall. Now, I want to go back and break this story down. I'm talking about the actual what happened. Here in 5.4 of Deuteronomy, Moshe tells us that God is speaking, He's between God and the people. But God's one speaking. Remember, Deuteronomy is very clear. God spoke ten words and He added no more. Now look with me, just for uh, a point, look at Exodus 19. Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 5 are two accounts of the giving of the ten words. And I want to pick up uh, Exodus 19, 24. So Jehovah said to him, Moses, to Moses it means, go down and come back together with Aaron, but let not the priest or the people break through to come up to Jehovah, lest he break out against them. And Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. God spoke all these words saying, I, Jehovah, am your God. And then it goes into the Ten Commandments. The question is, you see, they're different. Doesn't mean, don't, there's no reason for concern. It's a reason to dig deeper. Exodus 19, God tells Moses, look, go down, warn the people, bring Aaron with you, y'all come back up. And then uh, Moses does that. He goes down to the people, verse 25, we don't get word that he's back up or that he's moved in that direction. We go straight into the ten words. What does that mean? Not here to determine that today. Just notice that's the case in Exodus 19, verse 25, etc. Now, if you, uh, if you look, you follow along in our list... Uh, Exodus 20 and verse 18, people see the thunder, flashes of lightning, and so forth. They're scared. 
that jives. It gives us a little bit more detail in Exodus 20. The sight, you get the picture. You can almost imagine this dark, ominous, horrible thunderstorm, you know, and it's got them shaking and quaking. Now, look at the bottom of page one, just to touch this one more time. It says, uh, left-hand column, you speak to us and we will listen. This is what the people tell Moses. Well, the same story is told in Deuteronomy 5. Notice right next to it. Go near and hear all that Jehovah our God will say and speak to us all that Jehovah our God will speak to you and we will hear and do it. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Exodus here in 20 doesn't say do it. It just says, we will hear, we will listen. Deuteronomy 5 says that they say, we will hear and do. Now, here's a point for you. Again, I've done a lot of studies on Deuteronomy and in the Pentateuch overall, and here's something that Deuteronomy is very consistent with. Like, how consistent, Ross? Always consistent. I taught a class on this. There are four verbs that appear quite frequently in Deuteronomy, more so than any other book, not only in the Pentateuch, in the Bible. Listen, or hear, hearken, forms of listen, forms of learn, forms of guard, forms of do. Listen, learn, guard, do. Those four words occur many, many times in Deuteronomy. Get this. Sometimes, not all four, sometimes all four. Sometimes it's three of them, sometimes it's two of them, but they always appear in that order. If you have listen, learn, and do, it's in that order. It's never learn, listen, do. You follow? Listen, learn, guard, do. If you have learn and do, you always have learn and do. It's never do and learn. The writer of Deuteronomy never misses this. So the writer of Deuteronomy is going to say, hear and then do. It's not going to, the writer of Deuteronomy is not going to say, just do it, you can listen later. But, stay with me. Now, in fact, let's go to Exodus 24. But we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. Don't go to Exodus 24. Top of page two. Not let God speak to us. And if you notice over in the right-hand column, it says, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore. I'm, I'm fine with differences in wording. That's not what I'm looking for here. I'm looking for the concept, the idea, the phrase, what both of these texts, Exodus and Deuteronomy, say is that the people say, different wording, but they still say, look, you talk to God, you tell us what He wants, we don't want to hear His voice because we're afraid we might die. Everybody follow? Now, uh, go down left-hand column. I know this is, I hope you can follow what I'm doing here. Uh, again, I have this repeated in this place to show you how I'm lining Exodus and Deuteronomy's text. <clears throat> now look at the left-hand column where it says 2020 on page 2. Moses says, Don't fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of Him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Deuteronomy doesn't have that account. It just doesn't. doesn't mean that it didn't happen I just show you that if you want to know, like if in your mind in this story, you know that Moses says, y'all don't worry about this. Don't be afraid. God just wants to impress upon you uh, the fear of this event so that you don't sin. If you want to know where it says that, it's never in Deuteronomy. It's in Exodus only. It's the only way we know that. That's why it's important to study the narratives in all the places they occur. Now, 
Look at this, middle column, Deuteronomy 5.28, about halfway down page two. Jehovah heard your words when you spoke to me, and Jehovah said to me, I've heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. Guess what? Exodus doesn't know about this, or Exodus doesn't record this. Only Deuteronomy, the first person account of uh, Moses. Notice how it says in 528, Jehovah heard your words when you spoke to me. That's Moses is saying, but this isn't a text that says, and the Lord spoke to Moses and said to him, I've heard the words of this people. This is Moses saying, and I heard the Lord heard your words that you spoke to me. And he said to me, it's first person. Now, not only is it in Deuteronomy 5, but it's in Deuteronomy 18. Look, verse 17, and Jehovah said to me, it doesn't have in Deuteronomy 18, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you, but it does have, Jehovah said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. You see? Now, then something interesting happens. Remember, I'm looking for what takes place after the day of assembly. Now, if you follow Exodus 20, notice the next thing I have in my block is I have Exodus chapter 20, verse 19, through 23, verse 33, and that is what is called, that is what is called the covenant code by scholars. It's a body of laws. Um, that are given, that are contained here, which if you read this as a flowing narrative, it would follow the people stood far off while Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Then you get a whole list of assorted laws and rules and statutes, which really, if you read them, they seem a bit disorganized. And don't, don't, don't get too nervous when I say that. What I mean by that is they're, they're not necessarily arranged by topic. You have some that deal with justice in general. You have some that deal with the festivals. You have some which deal with... It, it's just a collection which scholars call the Covenant Code. Now, there are about five major collections of laws, rules, statutes, judgments in the Bible. And, uh, and we're going to get into these different terms like uh, where, is, where is a mishpatim, where are the mishpatim, where are the, you know, wh what's the difference in uh, a statute, a judgment? Uh, we're going to do all of that as we get into this study. But here are the bodies of laws. We have the covenant code, Exodus 20, verse 19 through 20, 33. Uh, sorry, th 23, verse 33. We have a sort of a variant to that in Exodus chapter 34, verses 11 through 26. And don't worry, our friend Baruch will have all these documented for you. We have priestly material that runs from Exodus 25, we're about to be there in our Torah cycle, through chapter 40, most of the book of Leviticus, and then uh, the book of Numbers. We have the Holiness Code. These are scholarly designations. The Holiness Code is considered to be Leviticus 17 through chapter 26. And then we have Deuteronomic Laws, which go from Deuteronomy 11, verse 26, all the way through chapter 28, verse 69. Now, if you compare Exodus with Deuteronomy... After the people are scared and they tell Moses, you go to God, we'll stay here, you tell us what he says, etc. Exodus says, oh, and then God spoke to Moses these laws, the covenant code. Deuteronomy says after they were scared, and this is recorded, there are also a group of texts that go from uh, chapter 6, verse 1, of Deuteronomy through chapter 9, verse 7. 
Now, a lot of this is exhortation and preparation to enter into the Holy Land, the Promised Land. Now, remember, Deuteronomy's body of laws comes later, chapter 11, uh, verse 31 through chapter 28, verse 69, or people break it slightly differently. But what I'm saying is, is that chronologically, if you look at Exodus's account, God speaks, people get scared, Moses tells them in Exodus, uh, don't worry, this is to impress upon you the fear so that you might not sin, and then the people stay far off, and Moses goes into the thick darkness. Deuteronomy says, 10 words are spoken, people get scared, uh, they request this of Moses, Moses tells God, God says they're right in what they've spoken, and then, uh, then you get into a body of different, different text at that place. And then they pick back up. Almost after this, they pick back up. It's, it's like the writer of Exodus and the writer of Deuteronomy have different filler between people are scared, say you go to God, and what's coming next? What's coming next? Now, let me show you what Exodus does partly to fill this next place. Exodus 24, 1, I'm at the bottom of page 2. Then he said to Moses, this is God, Come up to Jehovah, you and Aaron, Nadav, Avihu, 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to Jehovah, but others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Jehovah and all the rules, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. I'm on page 3 now. He rose early in the morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to Jehovah. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that Jehovah has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. Actually, in the Hebrew, it says, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will hear. Notice the order there. It's different. Deuteronomy never says do before hear. But Exodus does here. There's a rabbinic teaching that people have derived from this that say, people were so obedient that they said, we're going to do it before we even hear what it is. And people think that that's good. That's not good. It's not what was required anyway. Like I've used this example before. If I, I have six kids and eight grandkids and number nine's on the way, when Saba talks, here's what I do. I'll say, hold on, hold on. Not yet. Here's what I, here's what I ask of you to do. Could you do this for me? Please do this. I'll do it. No, no, ho, ho, wait, listen, listen. Take the can and go bring it to BB and help her in the garden, whatever. And if they start to run off, I say, like, hold, hold on. You know, you want to, I'm going to tell you, then you go do it. I don't want you just running out there and, you know. So the idea is that you listen, then you do. Okay, enough on that. Verse 8, and Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that Jehovah has made with you in accordance with these words. And Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up. They saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. Notice to your right, the columns. Nothing. Exodus has certain things, but Deuteronomy doesn't have those. Now you go, well, so what? Thank goodness we have the account in Exodus. But Deuteronomy is very clear on a couple of things. Deuteronomy makes it very clear. You saw nothing. Don't make anything. You didn't see anything. You heard a voice, but you didn't see anything. Exodus, this version in particular which is not shown in Deuteronomy, has this story about 
the elders saw. Now, people can go back and forth. Well, it's actually the Hebrew word for vision. It means they envisioned it. Well, in Hebrew, there is a word for vision. Uh, chazon is typically used. Uh, ra'ah means to see, and uh, you look at that. Go look that up for yourself and see what's said there. So don't just go with what people tell you, Ross or anyone else. Is, is this account um, reflected in both? It's not. Now, the interesting, one of the things that this brings up is it brings up the idea of the cult. And by cult, I mean the sacrificial cult. I don't mean like a cult, Jim Jones cult, that, that definition. I'm talking about the sacrificial system and when does it come in? Now, if you read Exodus 24, you get the idea that, you know, there's an altar in place and there are uh, sacrifices being brought and so forth. Now, the interesting thing, and we're not going to solve this today because I'm winding my class down, uh, but there are a couple of verses that I want you to consider. Uh, look with me at the prophet Amos. Look at Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5 and verse 25. It's just a question by Amos that you should answer. Um, Amos chapter 5 verse 25. Amos says, Did you offer sacrifices and oblation to me those 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? Now, some of you are saying, well, yeah. Does this contextually, look at it on your own, does this contextually suggest that Amos is expecting a positive response? Did you offer me sacrifices in the wilderness? Okay, let's look at a couple more just quickly. Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah 7 and verse 21. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, Jeremiah 7, 21. Add your burnt offerings to your other sacrifices and eat the flesh. For when I freed your fathers from the land of Egypt, I did not speak with them or command them concerning burnt offerings or sacrifice. But this is what I commanded them. Uh, do my bidding that I may uh, be your God and you may be my people. Walk in the way that I enjoin upon you that it may go well with you. Yet they didn't listen. They followed their own counsels, their willfulness of uh, their evil hearts. They've gone backward and not forward. From the day your fathers left the land of Egypt until the day, and though I kept sending all my prophets, my servants to prophets to them daily and persistently, they wouldn't listen to me or give ear. They stiffened their necks. They acted worse than their fathers. One more. Look with me. Um, well, yeah, look at Ezekiel 20. In 25, moreover, I gave them laws, this is God speaking, that were not good and rules by which they could not live. When they set aside every first issue of the womb, I defiled them by their very gifts that I might horrify them. That I might heart, that they might know that I am Jehovah. Interesting. Now, the question is, and this is for another class, is there evidence that there was an, an elaborate system of sacrifices in the wilderness period? <clears throat> now, I know a lot of you are saying, well, yes, there is. Okay. My point today is just to show Exodus. 24 has this passage. Deuteronomy doesn't include it for whatever reason. Everybody with me? Now, look at page 4, and you'll see that at page 4, <clears throat> uh, midway down, Moses entered the cloud and went up the mountain. This is where Deuteronomy picks back up. Deuteronomy hadn't had any of that other stuff until it says... When I went up the mountain. Now, in Deuteronomy 9, Moses doesn't tell us that he was part of a group that ate together and saw God. Not saying it didn't happen, just saying Deuteronomy doesn't know about it. Notice why he goes up the mountain. 
Deuteronomy says to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that Jehovah made with you. And he says, I remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Exodus 24 verse 18 says Moses went up the mountain and he was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Deuteronomy 9 says specifically he's on the mountain to get the 10 words, the stone tablets. Now remember when I started, I showed you in Deuteronomy 5, he says God spoke the words, um, he added no more, he wrote them on tablets and gave them to me. But I said, that doesn't happen yet. It goes down here. This is where it happens. Notice I put it in the center block, compare 522B, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. Notice that both Exodus and Deuteronomy say that it's written with the finger of God. You see, it's like two witnesses to this story. And then Deuteronomy adds, right-hand side, bottom of page four, and on them, what's on them? All the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain, out of the midst of fire, on the day of assembly, at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me two tablets of stone, tablets of the covenant. Now, go back one more thing. You'll notice that if you look at Exodus, between the going up 40 days and 40 nights, Deuteronomy says, Moses says, I went up the mountain, first person, to get the stone tablets. Exodus says, Moses, third person, was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights and then goes into six chapters of more laws. You follow me? Look, uh, 25, 1 through 31, 17, more laws. Deuteronomy doesn't have those. Not at this point. Deuteronomy has a book of law. It's chapter 12, roughly chapter 12 through 26. And people might fudge it one way or another a little bit here or there. All right. By the way, when you study, um, when you study this idea, <clears throat> uh, look back at chapter 24 of Exodus when Aaron and her were told that Aaron and her, top of page four, left-hand side, he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. Behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Now, this is after, I'm not going to make a big deal about this, but this is after Exodus 18, which has the establishment of people to deal with the disputes. But he's got Aaron and her like sort of the Supreme Court. You go to them because we're going up. I'm going up. Deal with them. Now, the two stone tablets uh, are the next thing. We get details about the stone tablets, what was written on them, uh, how they were written. You know those texts. Some of them are in my sheet. I hope that this exercise is helpful because when we compare and contrast, we see things that otherwise we don't notice. There are major sections in one, but not the other. Now, when we see something like this, we have questions. The questions could be, why are they where they are in the text? Why does one book record such things and another book not? When were they put there and by whom? These are all questions. Some assert that these details such as we're covering are not important. I say that they are very, very important. Now, as we continue our new look at the Pentateuch, we will discover many more things that have escaped the attention of students. We're going to approach these with humility, and I want you to know that if you read horizontally, it'll make all the difference in the world, at least in the world of biblical studies. Shabbat Shalom, Shavua Tov, look for...